Hello again. Welcome to the Harry Wolf Show. This is week two of two. Haha. <laughs> Let's just get started. Let's start things off today by talking about how Adobe is killing Flash. They published a blog post saying that in 2020 they're going to stop updating and releasing Adobe Flash. If you've been paying attention in the industry, you know that this has been a long time in the making, ever since back when Apple decided to not support Flash on the iPhone, and this is just really a milestone in the long, slow death of Flash. So Flash, we bid you farewell, you were good while you were here, and sadly we're not going to miss you much. In browser news, Google released a new stable version of Chrome, version 60, out to the public. It has a lot of nice user features, I don't really care about those, but in terms of developer features, there are four that I'm particularly excited about. The first is that there is now support for third-party badges. That means when you inspect requests going out from your browser, you can now have an icon visible to give you a very quick glance about what it's about. Whether it's an analytics network, or from Google, or from Facebook, having those icons gives you a very quick way to see where those requests are going to. Number two is that Chrome now supports a new continue to hear breakpoint feature. If you have a breakpoint in your browser when you're trying to debug something, and you want to jump from line 10 to line 20, you can now option click to line 20 just to jump straight to there to continue your debugging. I imagine it's going to save myself a lot of time just stepping over lines until I get to the next point, and I'm very excited about this feature. Async stacks are now default in Chrome 60. If you remember before, there was a check mark in the Chrome tab that says whether you wanted to see async stacks when you were debugging your breakpoints. That's enabled by default because the performance now is good enough to not really have to worry about the offset in performance hits that you'd have the rise to take when using that feature. And last but not least, number four is that objects, rest, and spread are now supported natively in Google Chrome 60. Ah, this is so exciting. Now, when you want to make a new copy of an object, you can just do the curly braces, dot, 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 the object, and voila, you have your new object. Mwah, magnificito. Magnificito. Yeah, something about magnificent. <laughs> Boo! Did I scare you? Did you react? Because React 16 Beta 1 is now officially out. Woohoo! The big deal about this is that React 16 comes with a completely new internal rendering system called React Fiber. You might have heard about React Fiber before. There's been a few bits of scares and worries in the community but ultimately it should be a no-op for when you use it or upgrading in your application. There are three big new features with React 16 and React Fiber. The first one, arguably the biggest in my opinion, is that React 16 is backwards API compatible. That means how you currently write your React components and how you use the React API is not changing and will behave mostly the same way in your existing application. This is a big deal. That means that you can simply upgrade your React version in your JavaScript application and then just do nothing else. And that's pretty incredible that the React team was able to pull that off. Now there are a few small breaking changes that React 16 has and they are noted in the React 16 release GitHub thread. But when I tested it out on my own application, I saw nothing the matter at all. So long as your deprecations are taken care of, then you should be up and ready to go. The second big thing about React 16 in it is that it includes a new feature called error boundaries. Before React 16, when an error occurred in your React application, in your application level code, it could actually get React into a broken state, making it unable to actually continue to function. With React 16 error boundaries, that is no longer the case. The error boundaries come with a new lifecycle method that you can implement that will be called whenever a child component throws an error. From there, you can then decide what to do, whether to render an error message or just to ignore it and just simply hide the rest of that part of your application. I'm worried that this is going to cause a lot of confusion in the React community about how best to make use of this feature, but I think with great power comes great responsibility, and so long as you know what you're trying to accomplish, this is going to be a great feature that will make many applications a lot more resilient to user-level errors. And last but not least, the biggest feature that I think everyone is very excited about with React 16 is that you can now finally return arrays from components. Wow. Took about 16 versions. I kid. 
So yes, you can return arrays from component, but that means that you're actually returning arrays from components. It's not simply having two sibling components next to each other, they actually still have to be in an array. So it's not the panacea that I was hoping it would be, but it's definitely a step in the right direction, making it easier and simpler to write custom components for your React application. Last week, the TC39 committee met. The TC39 committee meets to discuss ECMAScript proposals and seeing when and if proposals are ready to advance to the next stage. There are four stages in the proposal process, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. When a proposal reaches stage 4, it actually becomes part of the ECMAScript read JavaScript standard. In the meeting last week, a lot of proposals were advanced. A lot from 0 to 1, 0 being straw man, just trying things out, 1 a little bit more stable. Uh, there were some that went from 2 to 3, uh, 2 being having a little bit more fleshed out, 3 being on the cusp of being ready to be included in the actual proposal. Uh, a proposal can only get to stage 4 once it's actually been implemented by two browser vendors. So once a proposal reaches stage 3, it's all but guaranteed that it's going to actually become part of the ECMAScript standard and a feature that might come to a browser natively near you. Some of the more exciting proposals to advance are Advancing from stage 0 to stage 1 is the proposal to add native support for array.flatten and array.flatmap. Two features that right now you can use with lodash or underscore but having them included by default in the browser is going to make for a much easier and fun time. Advancing from stage 1 to stage 2, a bit of a controversial proposal is support for private methods and accessors. That means that with this proposal you can use a hash shine to make a property or method actually private to a JavaScript class. The way in which it's done underneath the hood is using some internal secret objects, but it means in practice that you'll no longer have to prefix private variables You'll just have to use the hashtag and you'll get that privacy actually enforced at the language level. That's pretty crazy that that's a proposal coming to JavaScript in the not too distant future. I don't think it's going to change your day-to-day -day life, but it might save you a few keystrokes not having to hit the underscore anymore. And three really awesome proposals moved from stage two to stage three. The first is support for promise.finally. You know try catch finally, you know promise then catch. Well, you'll soon be able to do promise then catch finally. A feature that I've been looking forward to for a while. It'll make handling spinners starting and stopping with Ajax activity a lot easier. Another proposal advancing to stage three are class fields. Now I've been using this for a while with a battle transform, but having this actually be passed to stage three gives me a lot more assurance that it's not gonna go away. It makes writing classes a lot easier and a lot easier to document by having those class fields declared at the top of the class file. Having this advanced at stage 3 is a great sign that the code I'm writing is not going to have to be changed in any distant future. And also advancing to stage 3 is support for optional try-catch bindings. That means that rather than having to write try-catch and having to pass an error object as an argument to the catch block, you can simply write catch with no parentheses just to catch the error. It's a nice little sugar that makes it easier to write some code and it's going to be nice to use. Well that was week two of the Harry Wolf Show. Hopefully you learned a few things that you missed. I'm hoping to come back at you again next week with even more news and fun. And for now I say adios.